it affected the very locale and life of the franchise. Without Peyton Manning, without his dedication to an involvement in life in Indianapolis and Indiana, without the magnetism of his personality and the commitment of, of, of him to being a full-fledged citizen of Indiana and mostly Indianapolis, uh, the, the franchise and football in the state of Indiana wouldn't be where it is today. So Bill, when people see how it turned out, especially the iconic career of Peyton Manning, the thought is, you know, it was simple. It was it was a layup. All he had to do was draft Peyton Manning at the top of the 98, uh, 98 selection lottery and all was good. Was it that simple? No, it wasn't that simple. <laughs> and there are a lot of people these days who have amnesia about that process and about where they stood relative to Ryan Leaf and, and Peyton Manning. Actually, um, <clears throat> when I arrived in Indianapolis, um, I got all the scouts together and I said to them, okay, everybody vote Manning or Leaf. And it was 50-50 right down the middle. Interestingly enough, I think it kind of mirrored in, in a sense the, the uh, uh, media sort of point of view those that were in favor of Manning had no real animosity toward Leaf. I just thought Manning was better for a number of different reasons. Those that, that, that were Leaf fans really had a negative feeling toward Peyton, which surprised me because they really couldn't back it up with anything. It was just that they didn't like him for some reason. And uh, at that time with everybody 50-50, I said, okay, we're going back to the drawing board. So I said to the video people, give me every pass that both those guys have thrown in their careers. And, and interestingly, they said, we don't have that capacity. And I said, well, figure out how to do it because I need it <laughs> within about two days. <laughs> so they did. And, um, and we formed a, a kind of an executive committee, which consisted of the senior scouting people. Um, uh, Tom Telesco and Dom Neely, who later joined me, were not there. They were still in Carolina. Chris Polian was there. Um, uh, we, we, Bob Turpening uh, was there working for the Colts. Uh, and then, of course, ultimately, Coach Mora, uh, Tom Moore, the offensive coordinator, and Bruce uh, Aarons, the quarterback coach. Uh, we, we, we kind of existed as a, as a senior executive committee who were ultimately going to have the most input into the decision. And, uh, and so we all went over the film uh, any number of times. Uh, I think I, I went through it at least five. Um, and then about a third of the way through the process, uh, I asked Bill Walsh if he wouldn't mind looking at the same tape we were looking at. And he readily agreed. And um, and he came back with, with his opinion, uh, which was decidedly pro-man. Mm. And um, uh, that, that was the first real de definitive um, answer that we'd gotten. Uh, and it, it was important coming from someone of Bill's stature and and obviously his, his knowledge of quarterbacks. Um, what, 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 what most people miss in, in judging quarterbacks, and you and I are in the same boat right now because we don't have access to the information, is the intangibles. Uh, work ethic, personality, processing speed, ability to learn, retain, and operate at, at a high level under duress, you know, with, with, with very, very complicated information. Um, all of that is measured by testing, uh, both with pen and paper, sometimes with iPad or computer, nowadays with computer, um, and then on the whiteboard and with film in meeting with the coaches. As we got toward 
the middle of March, um, there was some clear separation between Peyton and Ryan. There was a big bump in the road early in March, which was the combine. Uh, and that was that uh, we were scheduled on one night, the opening night of the combine, to meet with Ryan for 20 minutes. It's a, it's a protocol set up by the NFL. And then the following night with Peyton, this whole executive committee, if you will, were waiting in our room at the Holiday Inn and uh, and Ryan never showed up. No one ever called. No one ever said, uh, gee, he can't make it. it. Nothing. So naturally, we were a bit perturbed. I was most concerned about whether or not something had happened to him. Um, but I checked with the people who ran the combine and they said, no, he's here and everything's good. So um, obviously, word leaked out. I mean, you can't keep something like that private. Uh, the headlines the next morning were that Ryan Leaf had missed his meeting with us. And um, and, and Steinberg uh, immediately said that I had given him the wrong date and time, uh, which was an absolute lie. Uh, I had never spoken to Steinberg at all. And and, and we everybody knew what the, the date and time was. He subsequently admitted that, that it was incorrect. Um, so that it, I, I, my relationship with Steinberg uh, went didn't go down very much because it was always a, it was at a low ebb anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> that didn't bother me at all. <laughs> but Bill, here's the thing, and and look, I'll own this. I was in the pro leaf camp, so there you go. You're talking media. Yes, that's that was me. Uh, and again, I'll own it. Um, I wasn't anti Manning. I just thought. And, and what I'd like to get to with you here is I, like so many others, uh, at least on the information we had, focused on that physical attribute attribute thing, thinking this was the, the guy really built to be a, a, a successful quarterback in the league, whereas Manning, there were those questions that lingered about, okay, is the arm strong enough? Does he have, you know, those physical skills to really be successful as we look at Manning's career and see almost what feels like a flawless Hall of Fame career obviously there had to be some flaws or some things at that point that you were looking at so break down the the if you can the the picture of Manning you had versus the picture of Lee from a physical standpoint well what you're asking me to do is analyze the film and, I'll, and I'll, I'll take you there and then we'll go down the timeline and because it becomes much more clear as we as we go down the road toward the draft. Um, when I looked at the film, Leaf appeared to have a slightly stronger arm, but it wasn't it wasn't this positive. It what didn't make a difference. Peyton got the ball wherever he was supposed to get it and he got it there on time and he and he did it very well. But Ryan, to his credit, had taken his team a long way. Uh, that wasn't an exceptionally talented team, and and he he took them to the Rose Bowl. Um, the, the Peyton, of course, played in the SEC and 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 did a a terrific job for Tennessee. So it, it was kind of a kind of a tie. Peyton, I'd seen Peyton live three times, and a live look for me with a quarterback is really important because you see how he interacts with coaches, you see how he interacts with players, you see how he handles adversity when, when, when it happens and he has to go to the bench and people are booing or you know, coaches are yelling at him or whatever. So um, he, he'd, been, he'd been flawless in, in the three live looks that I'd had, over, uh, had of him over a couple of years. And, uh, and so um, interestingly enough, <laughs> as a sidebar, uh, we we saw him against um, Ole Miss in Memphis, and uh, and from that game we got in Carolina uh, a seventh round draft choice named Mangum, a tight end who, who played for like ten years. <laughs> we found him in that game, which always proves why you, you you know you should go out and scout, right? Anyway, um, Peyton was. Uh, uh, on the money with every throw, he was in command, et cetera. Had rough games against Tennessee, but they, against uh, Florida, excuse me, but they they were really the better team 
and that was a loaded Steve Spurrier team in those days. So it was, it was still pretty close based on the film analysis. Uh, Peyton's release was faster, uh, and that's important. And his ability actually to create a second chance inside the pocket was way better than Ryan's. So that was important. And we saw that on the tape, and Bill Walsh saw it on the tape. Explain. You mean movement? What What is that? What movement that in the pocket. Subtle movement in the pocket. Your first guy is covered, and now you got to move a little bit, maybe maybe two feet, three feet, to get a, a window to throw to your second guy. And, and Peyton was instantaneous doing that. It was obvious that he saw and knew where everybody was supposed to be on every play. He was he was considerably better than Ryan in that stage. Now he played more football too, so you have to take that into consideration. Uh, there was a canard out there uh, that you alluded to. So many said he's a product of the system. Well, I never understood that to begin with, because if a quarterback masters the system well enough to be a product of it, he's doing a heck of a job. <laughs> That's what he's supposed to do. Right. Right. <laughs> Secondly. Uh, he was the system because he was able to access and re every receiver and know where every route should go and where the ball should go based upon the coverage. So that was the film analysis. Um, and then we decided, well, we're going to go work them out. You know, we'll, we'll have a private workout, which when you have the first pick, you almost didn't always get. Uh, Steinberg said, no, you can't have a private workout. You got to go to the normal pro day, which is orchestrated. You don't get a chance to say to the player, I want you to throw this pass or that pass. I want you to simulate this coverage or that coverage and tell me where you go with the ball. You don't get a chance to sit down with him on, uh, on the chalkboard and go through all of the possibilities. But so what? You know, that's OK. Um, so we went to Knoxville, as I remember, and I'm very bad on dates so let's as the lawyers say stipulate that <laughs> I, I don't i know they were back to back and peyton went first but i don't know whether they were back to back days or or, or a week apart right. that, it's immaterial as commissioner tagley who used to say that's a detail <laughs> so uh uh the uh we went to tennessee and the first thing we learned, because Tom Moore has a drill where he asks the quarterback to stand on the goal line and without stepping forward, without winding up, without taking a drop, throw the ball from a standing start. And then he moves receivers back accordingly. And then he moves them at angles accordingly. And you can see exactly what the arm does because that's what he's throwing with. So um, the, the thing we came away from with that workout is, wow. This thing that Peyton has a weak arm is not true at all. As a matter of fact, his revolutions on the ball were way, way better than what we anticipated. I mean, he could put the ball wherever you wanted him to put it. When, when we had him throwing routes to receivers, um, I, I recalled a play against Kentucky in his senior year where the receiver was covered. He had a uh, uh, a corner and trail technique and the corner was right on top of him. He was not only in phase, he was hanging on him. And the only place the ball could go would be the upper left hand quadrant because the receiver was bigger and Peyton put it right in his hand. The guy caught it one handed, but he couldn't have dropped it because Peyton stuck it in there like it had Velcro. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, of course, we came to see many more of those uh, throws throughout his career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Bill, on the on the distant on the distance uh conversation, I I, I feel like a, there, there was a point at which you were uh talking with Tom Moore and I think Bruce Arians. Um and, and there was like a this this limit or whatever that had been seen in terms of distance. And and I, I want to get the yardage right. I, I want to hear maybe it was 40 yards or something like that in terms of just the sheer distance of his throw. And you you were questioning that with them and tell the story. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's sixty yards. Sixty. I'm uh, sorry. Yes. This this was after we'd come back. From, I think it was after we'd come back from the workouts, uh, and it, it was one of the one of the few things that was in the media that I reacted to because this was a kind of a late development. He's got a ceiling on his arm. That's what that's, that's it. He can only throw it 
50 yards or whatever whatever the number was. So I said, okay, I, it, I came in on a Sunday and, and, and I, I took out all the film and I measured every throw. So it turned out to be 59 yards was this, uh, 60 yards was the ceiling. After that, the ball began to wobble a little bit. So naturally Tom and Bruce are in. So <laughs> I go down the hall and I say to him, Hey, I just took off all the film. And, uh, and it's true, Peyton does have a ceiling at his arm, and it's about 60 yards. And and Tom looked up at me, with, you know, with the typical Tom Moore laconic look on his face, and he said, okay, we won't throw any passes more than 59 yards. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> so they went, we went out to work out Ryan, and it was pretty close to the draft, as I recall, you know, within a month, certainly. And... He, they did give San Diego a private workout. And so as we were coming into the pro day workout, um, Bobby Bethard and company were leaving. And we said hello and exchanged pleasantries. We were fans, just as, you know, friends and fans as well. And just as well as, as, as we were about to leave, Bobby turned to me and said, listen, if you're interested in trading a pick, um, we, we'd be interested. I said, I don't think we're going to do it, Bobby, but certainly if we if we are, thanks. It's good to know, and I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch. And and as we walked away, I looked at our group and said, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. that tells us a little bit about where they, where they, where they may stand right now. Sure. So um, we went to the workout, and uh, as, uh, as Ryan was throwing all these orchestrated routes, Tom Moore and I were standing together, and I said to Tom, holy mackerel, Peyton's got the stronger arm. And Tom said, yes, that's true. And then there was a meeting with Ryan afterwards, uh, which didn't go well at all. Coach Moore asked him, to, uh, I have to go back and talk about our meeting with Peyton. He, uh, this is back at the combine. Uh, he came in with, 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 a, with a, a briefcase and a, and a folder, you know, a notepad, and he said, uh, would you mind if I asked you guys a few questions? We said, no, not at all. So keep in mind, this is 20 minutes. So he's asking questions and taking notes and all of a sudden the horn blows, uh, things over with. So <laughs> we stood up and shook hands and said, you know, nice to see you, thanks for coming. And he said, uh, I'd like you guys to remember this. Uh, he said, if, if you draft me, I'm, I'm in the day after the draft. And, uh, and I said, well, you, you really can't do that. There's a rule against that. You can't come in um, until a, a week after the draft. And he said, well, I don't care about that. You can figure that out, but I'll be there the day after the draft. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> then he left the room. We looked at each other and said, holy mackerel, he just interviewed us. <laughs> so, and, yeah. How did, how did the Leaf interview go? Uh, badly. Um, Jim asked him the very same question that Peyton had, you know, offered up uh, when he's planning on coming in. You can come in a week after the draft. Uh, actually, five days, I think, was the rule. And uh, and Ryan said, Coach, I can't make that. Uh, my buddies and I have a, a trip planned to Las Vegas, and we've planned this for a long time. And so I'll be in, uh, you know, three, three, three days or so later. And uh, that obviously wasn't what you wanted to hear. Sure. Uh, and, and you know, he clearly, I forget what he weighed. I've heard people talk about, you know, ridiculous numbers like 260 or something like that. But it wasn't that high, but he wasn't in great shape. That was a concern. But by that time, we, we, we had enough info and enough background, enough intelligence to tell us that there was a vast difference in maturity level between Ryan and Peyton. And we were anticipating to accelerate the quarterback's development that we would play him. Ryan had only played, I think, two seasons. Peyton had played four. Uh, but it was pretty clear that that Ryan wasn't ready to handle, uh, you know, emotionally the, the 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 tough part of playing quarterback in the NFL. So sure. as we left that workout and that meeting, there was a pretty wide separation at that point. So Bill, 
I mean, you're making the top overall pick, um, and it wasn't your first crack at that. Uh, go back to your time with the Bills, uh, Bruce Smith, and, and really the very first player when you were in, in this position to do this, uh, it was Bruce. And we know what he's become, uh, one of the all-time uh, great, if not the greatest defensive end in, in, in NFL history. When you're making that choice, though, and especially a quarterback, and, and knowing how this Manning career, what it's become, could you envision it being what it was? Could you realistically tell yourself, we know it, all, all this confirmation you had that he was the right guy to pick, but to what extent did you expect his career to be what it became? I'd like to tell you that we were soothsayers and knew that. But <laughs> that wasn't the case. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, soon after uh, we got back from the, the workout trips, I had a meeting with uh, Jim Irsay, our owner, who, by the way, is a top flight football guy. So he said, give me the upside and downside of both guys. And I said, well, the upside of Peyton is that if we're right about him, he's got what it takes to lead us to the promised land. The downside is that if we're wrong, the worst that can happen is we have Bernie Kosar. And with Ryan, um, if we bust, it's a big bust. I don't think there's there's anything, any redeeming situation there. I don't think he's going to grow up fast enough and have enough of what it takes to overcome the adversity that any quarterback in the NFL faces. And so it, it might be a complete washout. Um, and so Jim just shrugged his shoulders and said, okay, that's good enough. Bernie Kosar is good enough. <laughs> well, he, he, with all due respect to Bernie, he's a friend of both of ours yep. and had a great career. You know, Peyton surpassed that, but that tells you how good a scout I am too. Uh, <laughs> we're just, uh, you know, you said it best. We firmly believe that he had what it take took to make us a winner okay and in terms of the current situation we have now uh with this upcoming 2023 draft where there will be a quarterback taken at the top i mean that's why the panthers uh, made their deal to go up there exactly who that guy will be. I Maybe there's a little mystery involved, but a lot of discussion about Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, is, of course, in this conversation. I, I'm not asking you to compare the players to what you you dealt with in 98, Bill, at all, but the decision-making process, uh, and you know the people involved very well, especially Frank Reich uh, with the Panthers, uh, your former quarterback in Buffalo and, and a longtime uh, associate of yours, in friend of yours through the years and mine. Um, how do you sort of see it playing out in 2023, maybe versus 1998 when I'm thinking that, you know, the availability of information, all the things that are kind of there now versus what you dealt with uh, then. And you, and I know you did your research then, but I, are we in a, a different place in trying to assess a top overall quarterback pick? I don't think so. I don't think so. If you look at it from the club perspective, and Frank and I talked way back in, when he first got the job in Carolina, and he asked me a similar question. And I said, just follow the process. Follow the process all the way through. Block out the noise, because the noise it, it does not have, the people who make the noise don't have the information that you have, uh, either from an experiential standpoint or from a factual standpoint. So just block out the noise go through the process, force the organization to go through the process. And, and then at the end of it, you'll make the right decision for you. And so the ability to compile the kind of background information that, uh, that we did with the, the Manning Leaf uh, uh, decision was, is still there. Uh, and in fact, if anything, it's gotten a lot more, uh, a lot easier to, to, to do because of the electronics, but the information is still the same. Um, the testing has become a little bit more sophisticated, but not a whole heck of a lot. You know, it's, it's, there, there've been no breakthrough tests. There's no Rosetta Stone out there mm. that tells you that 
this guy's going to be a great quarterback and this guy isn't. Um, you, 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 you still have to make value judgments based on what you see on the tests. There are more of them and there are more people talking about them, many of whom don't understand what they're talking about either. Uh, so it, the process remains the same. The workout situation is the same. Um, the ability to connect with the college coach is the same. Um, the agents still play the same role, you know, which is basically cheerleader and hype master and so on. Uh, and so that hasn't changed. And, and, and that's their role. I mean, I, I'm not knocking agents. I mean, that's what they're paid to do. Right. Um, so you just need to orchestrate the process as an executive, orchestrate the process, um, go through it, make sure every I is dotted and every T is crossed, and then make an unemotional decision based on the data as to who you think is the best pick for you. And I, I don't think any of that has changed. Um, there, there, there's more noise, uh, but you block that out. I mean, I, I, I'm, I, yeah. Would you say, Bill, is has the has the pressure to get it right changed from the standpoint of what the NFL is now? This more mammoth. It was a big entity in '98, but it's a far more mammoth one now. Far greater attention, far more media attention, and and especially social media. But as we look at at what the top overall pick getting it right or wrong represents today versus 98, has is, is that changed? No, I don't think so. And I may be a dinosaur, but social media means nothing to me in terms of judging players. I, mean, I, I don't say that. I don't say that either tongue in cheek or, or in a denigrating fashion. It just doesn't um, because it doesn't de deal with facts. Um, the noise, there's, there's more of it, obviously, but. If you don't pay any attention to it, it's not there. And, and, I, and I've never paid any attention to it in, in reality. Um, so and certainly not in judging players. So um, it can have an effect on your team in the NFL when you're playing during the season. It can have some effect there, but it does in terms of judging players. And look, whether it's 1998 or 2023, if you miss on the number one pick, it's likely the last one you'll make. Uh, you know, that's a fact. Mm. <laughs> Again, you deal only with facts and not emotions. It's a fact. You, you got to get it right. It's just that's what they pay you to do. And if you don't, the likelihood is you're not going to keep your job very long. So you just have to live with that. It's, it's exactly like people who, and I don't mean to equate the two, but you know, someone who flies a plane has a, a huge responsibility. He's got human lives at stake, but he can't worry about that. He's got to go through the process of what he's been trained to do and he or she, what they've been trained to do and, and how they react. And that's the same thing here. You go through the process of what you've been trained to do and what your experience tells you and, and don't worry about the consequences because uh, you, you can't control that.